Wade Webster was our speaker last night and is tonight and is scheduled to be tomorrow night. We appreciate him so very much. Besides being a great speaker publicly, he's a very personable man privately. We appreciate him and his family that is with him so much. I don't know all his family. I'm sure I'd appreciate them all if I knew them, but it's been a pleasure to get to know Wade and Jennifer and uh, Sophie a little bit. We are, are very thankful that you're here, Wade, and we'll turn things over to you now. If you will, take your Bibles and open them to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 9 will be our text tonight. I'm going to give you a quick outline of this text and then we'll go right into our lesson. We have a lot to say, a lot to try to get through tonight in explaining this text. But as we look at the text, I want to read the first two verses of the nine verses that we're going to discuss tonight. It says, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal despisers of good. Now, as we look at these verses, we see what is coming, we see when it is coming, and we see why it is coming. What is coming is perilous times. The word perilous is a word that refers to rough waters, rough seas. Rough seas are coming. Rough sailing is coming. That's what Paul is telling Timothy. Paul is telling Timothy, Timothy, everything is smooth and flowing gently right now, but it's not always going to be that way. You need to be ready for the rough water that's coming. Some of you have probably been white water rafting before. And you know you get on board that raft and you start out and the, it's just gently moving and you're able to kind of look around and enjoy the scenery and talk a little bit. But then the guide will say, okay, we're about to hit a rougher stretch of water. You need to get ready. And so you, you get to the point to where you're not talking as much. You're not looking as round as much. Now you're focused on the river. Now you're focused on what we need to do in order to get through this stretch and make it safely to the other side without one of us or all of us ending up in the water. And so that's what Paul is doing with Timothy here. He's saying, Timothy, I'm your guide. And things are great right now, but they're going to get rough. And so you need to get ready for that time when that time comes. Now, Paul knew something about rough water. You read in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 some of the things that Paul had to deal with. And Paul said, three times I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I was in the deep. He talked about being in perils of water. He talked about being cold and naked. He talked about the things that he had endured and suffered. He knew something about rough waters. Acts chapter 27, he's going to Rome. He's always wanted to go to Rome. He wanted to preach the gospel to them. And God's arranging the passage. He's not going to have to pay a penny to get there. He's not going as a free man. He's going as a prisoner, but he's still going to have the opportunity to preach the gospel in Rome. God has a way of working things out. And Paul is on this voyage. They've stopped in this voyage. And they're in a small harbor, but things are good. And they're decided that they're going to go to the next harbor because it's a better harbor. It has more conveniences. It's more enjoyable during the winter time to be in that harbor. And so they determine that they're going to sail to that next harbor. And Paul warns the centurion that's in charge of him, it's too late in the year. We don't need to get on the open seas this late in the year. There are going to be problems. But the centurion listens more to the captain of the ship. His motivation is money. His motivation is I've got this cargo and I want to sell this cargo and then I can get in another load and I can go somewhere else and I can make more money and so don't hold up my making money. The other sailors and the other people on board the ship, they want a, a, a comfortable place to winter in. So that's their motivation. Paul says, listen, this is going to be with much harm both of the ship and the cargo and of lives. This is not going to end well, Paul says. Let's not get back on this boat and start sailing again. But the south wind, the Bible says, was blowing softly. And they decided that that's all the evidence we need. We've got time to make it to the next harbor. Acts chapter 27, if you've never preached it this way, is a great chapter to preach on marriage and the voyage of marriage. Just follow the text, read the verses in the text, and read about the anchors, and read about casting aside every weight, and read about all the different things that 
that are, are tied to this voyage that also have an application to marriage. It'll be a great study for you to do. But Paul knew something about rough seas. And so Paul says there's a rough patch that's coming and Timothy, you need to be ready for that. Now, he tells, us, he tells him in 2 Timothy chapter 4, if you'll turn over there in verse 10, he says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they'll heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn away their ears from the truth and be turned aside unto fables. Paul says, Timothy, this time is coming. These perilous times are coming. The time's coming when people are not going to want you to preach the Word anymore. They're not going to want you to tell them the way things really are. They're going to want you to scratch their ears. They're going to have itching ears. Now, A.W. Tozer, in one of his commentaries, was talking about this verse, and he explained that in New Testament times, the pigs of the day were uh, afflicted with a parasite. And that parasite would get into their ears and it would make their ears itch. It would make them uncomfortable. And so these pigs would go over and they would find a rock pile and they would scratch those ears against that rock pile trying to get a temporary relief from it. It didn't fix the problem. It didn't deal with the parasite. But it made them feel a little better for the moment. And so what Paul is saying is, listen, these people today, they don't want to hear the truth. These people today want somebody to tell them what they want to hear. And so these false teachers, they're just a rock pile. That's all they are. Somebody's piled up a pile of rocks and they're going over against those rocks and they're getting some temporary relief. They're feeling a little bit better about themselves. They're leaving the building feeling like like they're okay with God. Like their life and their marriage and everything about their life is good. Paul says, that's not really true. They're still sick with sin. They've still got a deadly disease running through their system. And yet, they've been made to feel better by these false teachers. Jeremiah was talking about that in his day, wasn't he? Jeremiah said, these false prophets, they're telling you it's going to be no captivity at all. If there is a captivity, it's going to be a very short captivity. It's not going to last 70 years. Don't worry about it. They were preaching peace, peace when there was no peace. And Jeremiah says, and my people, they love to have it so. That's what they want. That's what they want to hear. Paul says perilous times are coming. Rough waters are ahead. When men would rather hear fables, when men would rather hear stories than they would truth, then rough waters are ahead. We're facing that. We're dealing with that today. This text has great application to us as we'll see. So we see what was coming. That was perilous times. We see when it was coming. It was coming in the latter times or in the last days. Now usually when we talk about the last days, we talk about, we talk about Isaiah chapter 2 or Daniel chapter 2 or Joel chapter 2 and we're talking about the church and we're talking about the fact that the church is going to be established in the top, top of the mountains, exalted above the hills. The church is never going to be destroyed. The church is going to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And we, we talk about all the good things that are coming for the church. And we ought to do that. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 16, Peter's going to say, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Acts 2 is recording what was talked about in Joel chapter 2. Good things that are occurring. But we need to understand that in the latter times, not everything's going to be good. Not everything for the church is going to be a blessing. There are going to be some challenges. There are going to be some curses. There are going to be some things that we're going to have to work on and we're going to have to deal with in these latter times. And that's what Paul's talking about. He's talking to Timothy about some of the hardships that are coming his way. And then he says, here's why it's coming. And he says, for men will be. Look at verse 2. For men will be. You see, the problem is men. Men are the problem. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 29, Solomon says, God made man upright, but man has sought out many inventions. You see, God made man this way, but then man decided he wanted to go a different way. He wanted to do something other than what God wanted him to do. And so that's why we have the mess. That's why we have the problems. That's why we have all the difficulties that we have in our world today. Because men have chosen differently than God created us or intended for us to be. A number of years ago, in a British newspaper, there was a question that was asked, and readers were invited to submit their answers. And so the question was this, what is wrong with the world? 
You can imagine how many responses you'd get to a question like that. G.K. Chesterton, a religious figure in, in that country, read the question and he wrote a two-word response. What's wrong with the world? I am, he said. His answer is published. I am. Oh, you want to know what's wrong with the world? I'm what's wrong with the world. You're what's wrong with the world. Men are what's wrong with the world. Now, I, I don't mean that in the sense that we're Christians because as Christians we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. I get that. But what's wrong in my marriage? I am. What's wrong in my parenting? I am. What's wrong in my workplace? I am. What I mean by that is that I've got my weaknesses. I've got my difficulties. I've got my shortcomings. I've got things that I need to be working on and I need to be doing better better. Sometimes I focus so much on the speck that's in my brother's eye that I miss the beam that's in my own eye. I miss the problems that I have in my life that I need to be working. That doesn't mean that I don't have a time or a place for helping others with the problems they have or preaching against sins or preaching against sins that aren't in my life but maybe in somebody else's life. I'm not suggesting that. But I'm suggesting that I better be preaching to myself. Because otherwise, I will be a castaway. You know what? I want you to go to heaven. I really do. And I'll do everything within my power to try to help you get there. Do you know what? I want to get to heaven. And I need to be making sure that I get there. Because the greatest way that I can help you to get there is by making sure that I'm going to go there. So that if you're watching me and if you're following me and if you're listening to me, then we're going to end up in the same place that we're going to go to the same place together because that's the way God intended for it to be. Now as we think about the problem being men, I want us to look at the context and I want us to see within the context that men really are the problem. And he's going to talk about the, the, the nature of the problem that we're dealing with and that is that it's a problem of the heart. Someone has said that the heart of the problem is usually a problem of the heart. And that's true. You know, the biggest thing that we deal with in life and we have to try to fix in life is the heart. You know, we, we preach on attendance and we tell people that they need to be at the services of the Lord's church. They need to come to Bible class as well as every other service that we have. They need to come to each night of the lectureship and each night of the gospel meeting. We, we emphasize that and we're right in doing that. The Bible does that. But you know, that's a problem of the heart. And we don't change people's hearts. We're never going to change their attendance. We're never going to get them to be there and get anything out of being there unless we change their heart. It's a problem of the heart. Most issues are. We have to work on the heart. Keep your heart with all diligence because out of it are the issues of life. Proverbs 4.23 As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23 and verse 7. We've got to work on the heart. We have a heart issues. The, the main issues that we deal with in the Lord's church, whether we're talking about anteism or liberalism or whatever we're talking about, it's a problem of the heart. We've got to get people's hearts right. And so Paul's dealing with the heart here, and he's going to deal with those that have three heart conditions. Some are lovers of self, some are lovers of money, and others are lovers of pleasure. Those are the three things he points out in the context. And then he's going to give some, some symptoms in the context that deal with those three problems. Look at what he says in verse 2. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. Then when you skip down to verse 4, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure. So those are the three lovers that we're dealing with in this, this text. They love self, they love money, and they love pleasure. Now if you want a description of our world today and what's wrong with our world today, there it is. Men love self, men love money, men love pleasure. That's what's wrong with our world. But notice that he adds to that in verse 4. In the New King James Version, it says lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. So they love these things rather than loving God. Now the King James Version says it this way. They're lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Now there's different readings there. One is they love these things instead of these things. The other is they love these things more, a little bit more than they love God. I, I like that reading, and the reason I like that reading is these people that we're talking about are not non-religious people. These are not people that never go to, to religious services. These are not people who never read their Bible or never pray or never do any of those things. They do those things. They have a form of godliness, but they don't have the power of it. 
Because they're just a shell of a Christian. They're just the outward appearance of a Christian. They're like the Jews of Jesus' day. They were honoring Him with their lips, but at the same moment, their hearts were far from Him. We have a lot of people like that. Sunday mornings, they're in our buildings. Wednesday night, they're in our buildings. But if you were to really get to their heart of the issue and really get to look at their heart, there are some heart problems there. They have a form of godliness. But they're denying the power of it. They're not getting the benefit out of Christianity that is there for them and should be there for them if they were as committed as what they should be. Now let's look at each of these things and talk about them. And then after we talk about these things, then we're going to talk about the uns. Now one thing that you'll see in this context as you look at this list of things that are mentioned, a lot of them begin with a UN, un. Unforgiving, unloving, unmerciful, ungodly. You're going to see that. And so that's a symptom of these heart problems that we're talking about. But first of all, they're lovers of self. You ever heard, ever read much Greek mythology? I don't like to read Greek mythology, but I know a little bit about it. know enough to get me in trouble, probably. But you remember in Greek mythology that, mythology that there was a man named Narcissus. Narcissus. And you, you think about this man who was evidently handsome or beautiful, and you remember that he had a lot of suitors, a lot of people that wanted a relationship with him and were seeking him, and he, he didn't want a relationship. But then he sees his own reflection in a pool of water, and he falls in love. He falls in love with himself. He falls in love with his own image. He doesn't want anybody else. He just wants himself. Nobody else can please him. He can only please himself. And so we think about all the people in our world who are not a part of myths, but who are in reality are just like that guy we read about in Greek mythology. They're just like that. They're in love with themselves. We live in a selfie generation, don't we? It scares me to death. It bothers me to see people who take selfies. I don't mean that you can never take a selfie, although I don't know why you would, but maybe you could take one. But I'm not talking about people that take one. I'm talking about people that take hundreds that are always posting a picture of themselves, that are always doctoring up their image. And I imagine if you saw them in real life, you wouldn't recognize them because they've doctored it up so much. But that's not even the biggest problem. The biggest problem is why do you feel the need to constantly put yourself out there? Why? Because maybe you're a lover of self. Maybe you don't have the proper self-image. Maybe you don't have the view of self that you ought to have that the Bible tells you to have. You know, Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24, Jesus says, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. We need more self-deniers than we do self-promoters. We have a lot of self-promoters. We need more self-deniers. We need more people who put others first. You remember the acrostic that we used to preach and teach all the time from the book of Philippians? Joy, J-O-W, Jesus first, others second, yourself last. Well, we, we get in trouble if we really taught people that and people really took that to heart today because they put the why first. They put themselves before everything else. They, instead of denying self, they deny Jesus. Instead of following after Jesus, they're following after what they want. They're following after the desires of their heart. Go to James chapter 3. I want you to look at something in James chapter 3. James is a practical epistle. It's, it's practical Christianity. And in the book of James, James is talking about two kinds of wisdom. He's talking about earthly wisdom and heavenly wisdom. And so he begins by talking about the wisdom that's from the earth. And look at it. It says in verse 14, But if you have bitter envying and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. Now this is the worldly wisdom. Verse 13 says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envying and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. So here are the self-seekers. That's earthly wisdom. Earthly wisdom says you better look out for yourself. Earthly wisdom says you better put yourself first. Earthly wisdom says Sunday is your day. It's a day for you to use. It's the only day you've got off. It's a day for you to use, for you to sleep late. It's a day for you to pursue your pleasures. It's a day for you to watch football. It's a day for you to do what you want to do. That's worldly philosophy. 
Not heavenly wisdom. Heavenly wisdom says this. The wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield. What does that tell you about this heavenly wisdom? It's willing to yield. It doesn't have to be my way or the highway. I'm willing to yield. I'm willing to give in. I'm willing to allow you to get your way rather than me have to have my way. That's heavenly wisdom. That's the kind of wisdom we need. That's the kind of wisdom that we're talking about. That's the kind of wisdom that we're not seeing in 2 Timothy chapter 3 as these people are pursuing other things. You know, what's the nature of real love? The nature of real love is it doesn't seek its own. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Agape is a love that seeks the best for another person. You know, we have certain catchphrases in our world and they have a proper use and they have an improper use. For example, sometimes we'll say, some people will say, well, I, I've got to set my boundaries. I've got to set boundaries. And, and you know, I've I got to protect myself against toxic relationships. And, and I, I've got to make sure that, that I, don't, I don't get lost in the shuffle, as it were. I understand what people mean by that. And I understand that there is a proper use of that. I understand that we need to be in abusive relationships. And I understand that we can't let people mistreat us and take advantage of us. And I understand that for your protection and other things, that's necessary to have some boundaries. We better be careful, though, sometimes in allowing the philosophy of the world to be our philosophy. And I mean by that, let's just think about Jesus. What if Jesus had set boundaries? What if Jesus said, you know what, these people are toxic. You know, they're toxic. You know, these people, they're going to hurt me if I let them. These people are going to, they're going to, they're going to mistreat me if I let them. I'm thankful that His love was without those boundaries. I'm thankful in spite of the fact that I was His enemy, in spite of the fact that I was so toxic in my life that He was willing to reach out to me to save me. Though He was rich, yet for my sake, He became poor. He was willing to sacrifice for me. He was willing to put me first. He wasn't a lover of self. He was a lover of us. He loved us and He was willing to pay the price for us. And I'm supposed to have His mindset. Philippians chapter 2, I'm supposed to esteem others better than I esteem myself. There aren't a lot of people in our world to do that. And that's a problem. We have a lot of people that are like Diotrephes. They, they love to have the preeminence. They love to be in first place. Well, I've got, a, I've got an issue with that. And here's my issue with that. First place has already been taken. And it doesn't belong to you, and it doesn't belong to me. First place belongs to Jesus Christ. God gave Him the preeminent position. You can't have His place. You can't be in His position. First of all, I don't want you in His position. I want Him there because He loves me. He cares about me. He died for me. He's perfect. You're none of those things, and I'm none of those things. I need Him to be there. He's the preeminent one. I can't have the preeminence. You can't have the preeminence because He has the preeminence. That's true in our relationships in the church. That's true in the marital relationship. That's true in the parenting relationship. I have someone who is the head of me. I have someone who's in first place. And I, if I get that out of order and I put Him down and I take His position, my marriage is going to be in a mess. My home is going to be in a mess. The local congregation is going to be in a mess because things are out of order. We're supposed to be lovers of God, not lovers of self. So let's move ahead and let's talk about the next one within the context, and that is those who are lovers of money. Lovers of money. When we think about money, you have to think about our world. First Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10, we talked about last night, for the love of money is the root of all evil. You know, the Bible teaches us that we need money. The Bible teaches us, for example, that we need money to provide for our families and fathers are supposed to do that. Husbands are supposed to do that. We know that we need money to be able to pay the preacher, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 9. So money has a use. It has a purpose. Nothing wrong with it unless we fall in love with it. Unless we love it more than we love God. If we put it in first place, then there's a problem with it. And it's the love of money that is the root of all evil. And we see this in the Scriptures in the lives of Judas, who sold his Lord for 30 pieces of silver. We see this in the life of Demas, who chose this world over Paul, forsook Paul, having loved this present world. We see it in the lives of the rich young ruler who was not willing to follow Jesus because he wasn't willing to give up the riches that he had to help other people. 
And then we think about a man named Balaam in the Old Testament, Numbers chapter 22. You know, sometimes I just go back and read about Balaam. It makes me laugh. Not because Balaam was a good guy, or not because it's funny in that sense, but, but the way that God worked that out. Because here's this guy that says, when the king of Moab sends over to him and wants him to come and work for him, Balaam says, if he were to give me his house full of gold and silver, I, I'm not going to do that. And then he goes and asks God, can I do it? And God says, no, no, I don't want you to do it. So the king of Moab sends to him another time. He's already set the price right, a house of gold and silver. And this time, because he's determined to do it, God allows him to go. But even if God allows you to go, doesn't mean God wants you to go. Doesn't mean that God's going to make it easy for you to go. And so he gets on the back of this donkey. He's headed in that direction. And when he heads in that direction, he's going through kind of a narrow stretch and there's a wall there. And so as he's going through this donkey, he suddenly turns and runs his foot into the wall. If you don't read that and laugh, something's wrong with you. Have you ever been on... I, I'm not, I don't ride horses. I don't know very much about horses. And the last time I was on a horse, you know what he did? He got me on the gate post. He knew I didn't know what I was doing. And he got me on the gate post and then he took me out through the pasture and got me under a tree and tried to get me off that way. You've had that happen, right? Well, here's this donkey that crushes his foot against the wall. What does Balaam do? What does that donkey do? Just sits down. Oh, Balaam's angry. He's mad. He's mad. And God gives that donkey a voice. And that donkey says, am I not your donkey? Yeah, you're, you're my donkey. Have I ever not done what you wanted me to do? No, you, you've, been a, you've been a good donkey. Why are you hitting me? Why don't you hit me these three times? And then God allows His eyes to be opened and the angel says, here I am, I'm standing in your way, I've got my sword drawn. If it wasn't for this donkey of yours that ran your foot into the wall and sat down on you, you wouldn't be here right now. I would have killed you. I wouldn't have killed him, but I would have killed you. And so you owe your life to this donkey because this donkey is trying to protect you from yourself. He's trying to protect you from what you're trying to do. Even though you know that's not what God wanted you to do. Even though you know you should not be going over there to curse God's people. But here you are. Balaam says, I've sinned. It's one thing to say you've sinned. It's another thing to mean that. Balaam doesn't mean it. How do I know that? Because he keeps on going. He goes on over there and he tries to curse God's people, but God turns it into a blessing. And then when they, he isn't able to curse God's people, of course the king gets very mad at him. I hired you to do this and you're, you're doing the opposite of what I wanted you to do. You know what Balaam says? I know how to do it. I know how to do it. This is how we get God to curse His own people. You get them to be involved in relationships that are against His will, and God will destroy His own people. And that's exactly what He did. He taught the children of Israel to commit fornication, and through that fornication, God destroyed His own people because of that. You know where Balaam ends up dying? It isn't among God's people. He dies among the enemy. He goes over there and he ends up staying over there because he finds a way of being able to curse God's people. But here is a great example of one who loved money. Peter's going to say he loved the wages of unrighteousness. He loved the money. And a lot of people have sold out Jesus Christ for the money. Paul talks about covetousness as we noticed last night in Colossians 3 and verse 5, which is idolatry. Now Paul knew a lot, a lot about rough seas and sailing, but he also knew a lot about idolatry. Acts chapter 17 He's at Mars Hill. He's at Athens. And Paul says that his spirit was moved within him because he saw a city that was wholly given over to idolatry. In fact, historians tell us that it was easier to find an idol in Athens than it was to find a man. That's how many were there. Historians tell us that there were more idols in Athens than, than there were in the rest of Greece. Here was a city that was completely wholly given over to idolatry to the extent to where Paul was shocked by it. To where Paul was moved in his spirit by it. Paul finds this altar to an unknown God and that just blows Paul's mind. They're so concerned that they've, out, they've left out some God and among all these gods that they have that they've set up a generic altar. 
Paul says, I, 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 I got to say something about this. I've got to tell them something about the true and living God. And that's what he does in Acts chapter 17. But he knew something about idolatry. He knew something about idolatry because of Ephesus. You remember he preached against the idolatry there and they got upset with him because he was cutting into their pocketbooks. They were lovers of money, right? And you remember that they began to cry out for two hours. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. She's shouting for two hours the same thing over and over again. Why? Because they're idolaters. We look at that, we read that, and it doesn't register with us that we're living in the midst of idolaters. Covetousness. Do this sometime. Make a comparison through a study of the Old Testament between covetousness and idolatry. Here are some of the things you'll find. Covetousness puts something in the place of God. Same thing that idolatry does. Covetousness comes in a lot of different forms. Sometimes it's worshiping an animal. Or, or idolatry comes in a lot of forms, like worshiping an animal. Sometimes it's worshiping a man. Covetousness comes in a lot of form. What it appears in your life, whether it be houses or cars or clothing or whether it be whatever it is, it's different forms. It's still idolatry. You think about the idolatry of the Old Testament. What kind of people were the idolaters in the Old Testament? Were they peaceful or warlike? Oh, they were violent people. The Assyrians were idolaters. And when they conquered a city, they, they, they made a pyramid of human skulls outside of that city. They're known as the bloody city. Why Nineveh? Bloody city. Why? Because they have such a reputation for violence because they're idolaters. Why do we have so much violence in our world today? Because of idolatry? Because of covetousness? Because people care more about things than they do about human beings. More about things than they do lives. They'll kill you for your tennis shoes. We live in that kind of world. We live among idolaters. You know, another thing about idolatry you read about in the Old Testament, it was connected with sexual immorality. Oh, there, there was all kinds of immorality connected with it. Even at Corinth, it was a part of the worship of people at Corinth. What about covetousness? Why, why do you think we have pornography? Why do you think people produce that? Make that? Because they get paid for it. They're making money off of it. They don't care about you. They don't care about what it does to your life, what it does to your marriage, what it does to your family, what it does to our nation. They don't care about that. They care about money. And they're willing to sacrifice everything to get it. Well, we have that problem in our world. But let me, let me give you a couple of examples of that. <laughs> Abortion. Abortion. Why is abortion such a problem in our nation? It's a problem in our nation. It's a problem around the world, but it's a problem in our nation because of money. There's a lot of money involved in it. That's why people are willing to take innocent human lives, the most innocent of all. They're willing to do that because of money. Do you realize that since 1973, just in our country alone, there have been roughly 64 million, 64 million babies killed? That's one-fifth of the current U.S. population. We wiped out that many people in those years. Why? Bottom line's money. Whether it's on the part of the people that don't want to be inconvenienced, don't want the cost of raising a child or having a child, they want to continue living the sinful lifestyle that they're living, and so they don't want to take on this responsibility, or whether it's the doctor performing them and what he's going to make, or what he's going to get paid, or whether it's the women's groups that are getting a lot of money from it, whether it's the politicians that are getting a lot of money from it, it it's money is involved in it. It's the root of all evil, First Timothy 6.10. It's involved in this. But think about some other statistics relative to abortion. Think about this. Three out of, uh, out of ten of pregnancies in the U.S. end in abortion. Three out of every ten. That's of all pregnancies. Of unplanned pregnancies, it's six out of ten. Statistics tell us that one out of three women in America will have an abortion. One out of three who could have ever imagined that would be us? But it is. Think about the world statistics. 42 million abortions each year worldwide. Think about this number. 115,000 abortions every day. There are 35,000 abortions every day in China alone. Their one-child policy, it's a war against girls. 
It's the girl babies that are being murdered. It's the girl babies that are being killed. And yet feminist groups will, will support abortion, push abortion. Why? They really care about women? You think so? They don't care about those little girls that are being murdered. They don't care about those little babies. They don't care about that. We live in that kind of world where people love money more than they love people. Think about all the, all the bloodshed that's taking place. How is God? How is God patient enough to allow us to continue to exist? Continue to call ourselves a Christian nation and act like we are when we have slain so many of those little ones. Oh, judgment's coming. And I dread it for all of us. But a God, a righteous God, cannot allow that to go unchecked. We're thankful for the recent legislation. We're thankful for some of the changes. And we pray that they'll continue to go through and they won't be undone by those who would rather murder than to support life. Let me give you another example. And that's human trafficking. I don't know how much you know about human trafficking or not. But human trafficking is driven by money. It's driven by money. It is the fastest growing criminal enterprise at the moment. And it's the second most profitable criminal enterprise at the moment. When you think about human trafficking, let me try to give you a number on it. $150 billion a year business. $150 billion. That's what's driving this. Let me give you a little bit of information about it. I preach in the city of, or in the Houston area. I preach in Katy, but it's a part of the Houston area. Houston is number one in the nation in human trafficking. I live in the midst of human traffickers. Texas is number two in the nation in human trafficking. We're only behind California in human trafficking. And California is moving to Texas every day. So you can imagine how long we're going to be number two. We're about to be number one. But I want you to think about something when we talk about human trafficking. There are 30 million people that right now are being trafficked in the world. 30 million people. 5.5 million of those are children. Many of them are involved in physical bondage. A lot of them are involved in, in, in sexual bondage, sexual trafficking. I grew up in Alabama. I grew up an hour from Birmingham. I-20 runs through the town where my wife grew up. She lives just outside of, Bur lived just outside of Birmingham. I live just north of Oxford, Alabama. I-20 runs all the way to Atlanta. That is the sex traffic superhighway in our nation. I grew up there and never knew that. I I've been gone for years and never knew that when I traveled up and down that road, what is being done and occurring on that road. Oh, it's such a problem. I want to give you some Bible verses on it because we don't ever talk about human trafficking. But we need to be talking about it because it is a problem in our world. And if anybody's going to get involved in it and fix it, it's going to have to be us. Because we are the ones that really care about people. We care about them not only physically, but we care about them spiritually. We care about trying to take care of them in every way. And so we've got to, we've got to be the ones that will reach out and will try to help them and, and give them the things that they need. Go to Exodus chapter 21 and verse 16. Exodus chapter 21 and verse 16. These are not verses we use very often, but they're biblical. It says, He who kidnaps a man and sells him, or if he is found in his hand, shall surely be put to death. God says this is a death penalty offense. I'm not, I'm not playing with this. Deuteronomy 24 and verse 7. Deuteronomy 24 and verse 7. Look at what God says to His people. He says, make sure I get it right. 24 and verse 7. You shall not abhor an Edomite for he is your brother. Am I in the right chapter? I'm in chapter 23. I've got my eyes teary so I can't quite read like I want to. Verse 7 of Deuteronomy 24, If a man is found kidnapping any of his brethren or the children of Israel and mistreats him or sells him, then that kidnapper shall die, and you shall put away the evil from among you. You can go to Ezekiel 27 and verse 13, and we read about those that were dealing in human bondage. 
That's what they were doing. 1 Timothy chapter 1, if you'll look at the context that we're, we're in, or we're studying this week, look at 1 Timothy chapter 1 in verses 9 and 10. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and for the profane, for murderers of fathers and mothers, of, and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, here are those who are kidnappers. They're dealing in human bondage. I want to tell you a story. A story of a man named Gesno Marty. He's a preacher in Haiti, not a gospel preacher, a denominational preacher in Haiti, but it doesn't change what happened to him. He had a three-year-old boy. After services one day, his little boy was there at his feet, and the little boy wanted to go to the mom, and so he let the little boy go. Well, in about ten minutes, the mom came up and said, where is Gardy? Where, where's our son? He said, I thought he was with you. I thought he was with you. Well, Gardy was gone. Somebody had taken Gardy. Well, in Haiti, the way it works is the police don't go out and find leads. You have to go out and find leads and bring them back to the police, and then maybe they'll look into it. And so he has, since that time, every off day that he has, every holiday that he has, every time that he can, he goes out to the villages and he looks for his little boy. He hasn't found him yet. A group called Operation Underground Railroad got involved. It's an American organization. A guy that used to work for the FBI, worked for Border Patrol, and went into private practice. And so he decided to go over and help Gesno to find his son. And so he went over and got kind of behind the scenes and, and found a group that was selling children. And so they do an undercover investigation, go in, and they're able to rescue 28 children. They were selling the children for ten to $15,000 apiece. And they were able, through their their work to be able to rescue 28 children. And so Gesno is there and they bring these kids out and they look at all these kids and Gesno's son isn't among the 28. And so the director that was involved in this, this sting operation said, Gesno, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry that we didn't find your son. I'm sorry that your son's not among these little boys and girls that we've rescued. He said, Gesno was, was crying. His head was down. He said, all of a sudden, Gesno looked up and there was a smile on his face. And he's thinking, why is this father smiling? What's going on? So he said, did, did, I, did I miss something? He said, I, I was just thinking that if you had not come here looking for my son, you wouldn't have found these 28 kids. So it's because of my son that these 28 kids aren't going to be in that condition anymore. If it means I have to sacrifice my son in order for these kids to be rescued, then that's the price I'm willing to pay. And when I read that and when I heard that, I thought, that's what God did. In order for me to be rescued, in order for you to be rescued, He gave His Son so that we could be found, so that we could be saved. That's an issue that hits very close to home for us. We have been saved, we have been found, and now it's time for us to be involved in the mission and in the work of finding others, not only physically, but finding them spiritually and helping them to come home to God. Here are those who are lovers of money more than they are lovers of God. Then the final group that we're talking about within this context are those who are lovers of pleasure. Lovers of pleasure. He talks about in verse 4, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Luke chapter 8 and verse 14 is, is a context where he's talking about the sowing of the seed and the fact that there are things that choke out this seed. And one of the things that chokes out this seed are the pleasures of life. Pleasures of life so that they are unfruitful. You know why a lot of members of the church are unfruitful? Because of the pleasures of life. Because they would rather watch a ball game than they would come to a gospel meeting. And just being honest about it, they, they would rather go fishing than they would knock on doors and try to win the soul of their neighbor. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with watching a ball game or going fishing in its time and in its place. There's nothing wrong with it. But sometimes we love those things more than we love God. And we'll choose those things over God. And we'll choose them not only for us, but we'll choose them for our kids. 
because we want them to play in the NFL. We want them to be in the NBA. We want them to have all these things in life. And so if we have to miss services, if we have to travel out of town all the time, if we have to spend every extra dollar we have to get them there, then that's what we're going to do. What about getting them to heaven? What about getting them to have their priorities straight? Because if your priorities are not straight, theirs are not going to be. If you forsake the service of the church for pleasure or for money, guess what they're going to do? They're going to follow right in your footsteps. That's what idolaters do. You read the Old Testament, if the parents were idolaters, more than likely, what are the children going to be? They're going to be idolaters. If the parents are covetous, guess what? Children are going to be covetous. If the parents are always seeking pleasure, the next good time, that's what the kids are going to do. The Bible warns you about that. In 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 6, it talks about the one woman who is dead while she lives because she lives in pleasure, she lives in indulgence. It's talking about those that the church ought to help and those that the church ought not to help. We ought not to help those that are living in pleasure. You know, it strikes me if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and you're reading about those that we are to withdraw from, you know what's right in the middle of that list? If a brother be covetous. You ever seen the church withdraw for somebody for being covetous? I've never have seen that done. And I can tell you this, there are people that are covetous and they are idolaters. They have put something before God. They're giving their money to something other than God. Their lives, their time, their energy to something other than God. They're seeking pleasure rather than God. And that's a problem. Titus chapter 3 and verse 3 deals with this. As does James chapter 4 and verses 1 through 3. James says to his people, you talk about preaching, James says you have fattened yourself for slaughter. You're just making yourself fat so that when the day of judgment comes, you'll be ready for slaughter. What if I got up and preached that on Sunday morning? You got up and preached that on Sunday morning. That's not going to go over well. But it is true. We're that turkey, that Thanksgiving turkey that thinks, man, they sure are feeding me well. They sure are treating me well all the way until the time of judgment. And then you realize you weren't so grateful for the excess that you have. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 25 deals with Moses who chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He had pleasures we can't even imagine. Probably living during the time of Tutankhamun, probably living during that stage of Egypt's, Egypt's highest point where there was gold and where there were all these riches and excesses and they all could have been his. But he said, I don't want them. I want God. I don't want an easy life. I want a godly life. I don't want the riches of Egypt. I want the riches of heaven. I don't want men to praise me. I want God to praise me. And that's what he chose and that's what we ought to choose as well. Now let's talk about the uns, and I'm just going to hit them. We don't have time to really talk about them. But I want you to look at the verse, because a lot of people have these conditions of heart, and they're they're known by these symptoms. Look at verse 2, the last part of the verse, we read about those that are unthankful. We have a lot of unthankful people in our country, a lot of unthankful people around us. You know why? Because they're lovers of money and lovers of self. They love themselves and they love money and they love pleasure and they, they don't love God and because of that they're unthankful. Luke 17, only one of those that were healed of leprosy came back to thank God. Romans chapter 1 talks about neither were they thankful. Next we read that they were unholy. We have any unholiness in our world, unholy people in our world? Well, sure we do. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 and 10 talks about some of them. Those that are unloving, God is love, but a lot of people aren't loving. They're not like God. They're unforgiving. They hold grudges. They're bitter. They're not willing to forgive. If we don't forgive, we can't be forgiven. Matthew 6, 14 and 15. They're without self-control. They're undisciplined. You talk about our world, you're talking about people that are undisciplined. They don't show up for work. They don't show up for work on time. They don't pay their bills. They don't do the things that, that people ought to do. They're brutal. They're unmerciful. They'll cut you off. They'll kill you over nothing. They'll they'll mistreat you. They'll say whatever about you. That's the kind of world we live in. People that fall into those categories. Go to Romans chapter 1. And look at Romans chapter 1 because again we're reading about the uns. We're reading about these that have these conditions or these symptoms in their lives. They have these things in their lives because they're lovers of self. They're lovers of money. They're lovers of pleasure rather than being lovers of God. Look at Romans chapter 1. We'll begin in verse 29. 
being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, and maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil mindedness, they are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Now here he goes. Undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. He just gets on a roll there, doesn't he? These people have a problem of the uns. These uns are ruling their lives. It lets you know the condition of their heart. And then he talks to the rest of us in verse 32 because we know we're not among them, right? Then he says in verse 32, "...who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them." Now that gets a lot of the rest of us. We don't produce the bad movies. We just go to the movie theaters and watch them. We just purchase them on DVD. We just purchase them on Sling or whatever way we have of getting movies into our home. We just, we just buy them. We don't produce them. We don't make the little short shorts. We don't make the little halter tops. We just wear them. We just wear the jogging shorts wherever we want to go. We just dress like everybody else does. Oh, we don't produce the alcohol. We just have a social drink every now and then. Oh, well, we don't, we don't really talk that way, but we will read things and have that kind of language in them and not feel anything about it. The Bible says not only those who do these things, but those who take pleasure in those that do those things. They fall under the judgment of God. Perilous times are here because men love themselves, they love money, and they love pleasure more than they love God. But you know what's wrong with the world? I'm just going to finish here. What's wrong with the world is the church is not the church. The church is not being the church. We're not being the salt of the earth. We're not being the light of the world. We're not being what God intends for us to be. The salt has lost its savor because we're not very different from the world. We're a lot more like the world than we care to admit. And because of that, we're a part of the problem rather than a part of the solution. How is God going to use us to change our world if we don't have Him first in our lives? And if His Word and His will doesn't drive everything we say, do, and think. God needs us. You know, Abraham, I'm going to destroy the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and, and Abraham's pleading with God, if there be 50 there, 45, 40, 30, 30, he finally gets all the way down to 10. Now, if you know anything about the story, Abraham's going, well, there's Sarah, and there's me, and then there's our... Archaea, there's, 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 there's Lot and his family, there's Lot and his wife, and then there's Lot's three daughters and their husbands, and then there's his unmarried daughters. Abraham's counting in, in his mind. He's thinking about all the righteous people that are in Sodom. And if you got Lot's family, and you got Lot's daughters married and unmarried, and his son-in-laws, you add all them up, I think you got ten. And so Abraham's thinking, ah, oh, there's just ten. But the problem is, everybody that's in Lot's family, and really, and Lot's got his issues too, not what they need to be. He goes to his married daughters, and he, and he begins to plead with them, and they don't leave with him. They've married men of Sodom, and they've become like Sodom, and so he seems as one that mocks in their eyes. They don't go with him, so we don't have ten anymore. Then the two girls that do go out with him, they take Sodom with them because of what they plan to do after this fact. His wife, well, she's connected to Sodom because she looks back. And then, oh, poor Lot. Only one we got left. And the Bible says of Lot that the people of Sodom vexed his righteous soul. And yet Lot's sitting in the gate as a ruler in the city when we first read about him. If only Lot's family had been what Lot's family was supposed to be, those cities could have been saved. If only I am what God wants me to be and you're what God wants you to be and our families are what God wants them to be, then God can save this world. He can save this nation. But if we're not, 
Who's He going to use to do it? Because we're His instruments for that purpose. Tonight, if you need to respond to the invitation by obeying the gospel, becoming a Christian, believing, repenting, confessing, and being baptized, or if you need to come home and be restored, we invite you to come as we stand and as we sing. Why?